It's nice to be here. I just came from winter. Nice to come to a nice, warm, sunny house. <laughs> my, my kids are emailing me, asking me how is it to be in the warm sun. I can't break their hearts and tell them that it's been raining. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the uh, climate change issue and some of the arguments um, in my book, The Climate Fix. Um, let me introduce it, the book um, by, by explaining the title to you. Um, the title is a bit of an ink blot. Um, it's inspired by Mike, Mike Hume, and I'll talk about him in, in a few minutes. Um, but in the English language, um, and I think it's the same in Australia as it is in the US, the word fix has many meanings. A fix can be a solution. A fix can be a difficult problem. It can be an addiction. Um, it can be a technological fix. And part of the issue of climate change is we tend to map onto the issue our hopes, our dreams, our aspirations, our fears. Um, and for me, when I talk to people about my book and the title, um, it tells me a little bit where people are coming from, how they interpret the, the title. And I, I don't have any one of those meetings. I mean them all for the issue. Um, when I was in Italy uh, last fall, Italy fall, I gave a talk that was uh, translated simultaneous Italian English translation, and they translated the title as the climate mess. Um, <laughs> so with that as introduction, let me tell you my argument, and then I'll get into it. Uh, so if you're paying attention to this issue, and it seems to me that if you live in Australia, it's kind of hard to avoid this issue. Um, but here's some of the current context. Uh, the, the recent uh, climate negotiations under the Framework Convention on Climate Change in Durban ended in a historic decision to keep talking. Um, but they decided to put off decisions till 2015 or later. And since that meeting, uh, India and China have said, well, no, we, we didn't really change our positions. We had the same positions we had before. Um, Europe and the US are narrowly focused on economic issues, jobs, the euro, um, elections, and so on. The climate change seems to have completely dropped off the agenda um, of Germany, of the UK, the US. Um, it, it's, it's really amazing, and I've had a lot of um, fun watching what's going on in Australia over many years, um, the political leadership and the issue of climate change and how it's become really wrapped up in you know, forget about climate politics, just politics, politics. Um, and it is very much, I would call it a carbon drama, and I think it hasn't ended yet. Um, Japan and Germany, um, due to the, the really the horrific tragedy in Japan after the tsunami and the Fukushima disaster, um, have decided to abandon nuclear power, which means in both cases, uh, the carbon emissions have already increased dramatically. Uh, Germany is, uh, ironically enough, relying on uh, increased building of coal-fired power plants, um, and they're actually importing uh, energy from nuclear power plants in the Czech Republic and France. Um, Japan has seen its oil imports go up and correspondingly their, their carbon dioxide emissions, which you might take as a signal that uh, at least for now, publics in, in these countries have decided that the risks of nuclear power um, are, are more frightening, more threatening, more real, more tangible to them than the risks of climate change. Um, China and India keep growing. India, in their case, has said that they are perfectly willing to talk about uh, limiting their CO2 emissions, um, but come back after 2025. And so on. I mean, it's, it's not a very positive moment for those who are interested in climate policy after really the heights of optimism in 2006 and 2007. Um, and and what, one of the things I'd like to do in this presentation is to help I guess, give you an interpretation of this context. I think there's some common themes. Really, worldwide, we like to say that different countries, different political parties have different positions, but I'm going to make the argument that we're really all in the same boat politically, and there's a very straightforward explanation for why we are in the political situation we are with respect to climate change. Um, let me start uh, with uh, a few words of wisdom from Mike Hume, who's uh, from the University of East Anglia. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. Uh, he's a climate scientist, was the, the director of the Tyndall Center in the UK for a long time. He's written on physical science, social science, even uh, more cultural issues. His book, Why We Disagree About Climate Change, is really outstanding. I'd, I'd recommend it to you. Um, but let me just uh, read a few passages from that book to start out. Arguments about climate change are invested with powerful ideological instincts and interests. Solutions to climate change vary from market-based mechanisms and technology-driven innovation to justice-focused initiatives and low-consumption localism as a form of lifestyle, each carrying ideological commitments. It is despairingly naive to reduce such intense and legitimate arguments to the polarities of belief or skepticism about science. He continues, 
The problem here is the tendency to reduce all these complexities into a simple litmus test of whether or not someone believes orthodox scientific claims about the causes and consequences of climate change. This is the dividing in the world into goodies and baddies, believers and deniers. Climate change demands of us something much more sophisticated than this. So one of the things I'm gonna to try to do with this presentation is to rise to this challenge and give you what I would say is a sophisticated analysis of the climate change issue. Um, very often, you could look at the climate change issue and see this, this, this battle almost to the death between the, the skeptics and the alarmists or whatever pejorative terms you'd like to lose and, and, and get the impression that they really think that if they convince the other side, whichever the other side is, if, to understand the science as they see it, they would just come to share their values and political preferences. Um, and I think we know from many different areas where facts aren't contested, people have a wide range of values. So what I'm gonna to try to do is to give you a sophisticated presentation that gets us beyond what I think is a rather inane and long-term and somewhat self-destructive debate over the science. Now let me start uh, by talking about what I would call the mainstream approach, the way that the climate change issue has conventionally been framed in public discourse in the scientific community um, as a starting point to suggest a point of departure. Um, what, what we do is we start with some uh, emissions projection that is, this is this orange curve going into the future. We plug those emissions into climate models, which give us some scenarios for the future with global temperatures um, increasing. Um, we have decided um, through the political process and depending on whose story you believe it was invented on the back of a cocktail napkin in Brussels, but the, there's a target of two degrees above pre-industrial that uh, we set as a target. And then we look at the different probabilities of exceeding that. We take the, that and work our way backwards and come up with some emissions trajectory. And these emissions reductions required to stay under two degrees, we then translate into targets and timetables for emissions reductions. And we say things like, the science dictates that we have to reduce emissions according to this rate over this time period. Um, now, there's a few concerns I have with this particular framing. One is that it says the science dictates that we do X, Y, or Z. Science doesn't dictate anything. It's our values that dictate something. But in a very real sense, these sorts of arguments, these slides, they're beautiful slides. They represent a lot of hard work by a lot of sincere people, but they're really nothing more than scientific performance art. It's very difficult for me as an expert in the field, and for, I would think for people who are not expert, to actually understand what these mean. What's behind these numbers? What do they mean in terms of policy commitments, in terms of costs, in terms of technology? So my interest in, in kind of reframing, rebuilding this, this issue from the bottom up is to get a, a intuitive understanding of the magnitude of the challenge that we're up against. And once you understand the magnitude of, uh, of a problem, I think that's the first step in actually taking steps to deal with it. Now let me say, um, some of my work has been criticized by people who say things like, why in the world would you want people to truly understand the magnitude of this problem? Are you against action? Um, so my view is that we're not gonna make any progress if we don't understand the nature of the problem. So what I'm going to present to you is not going to be comfortable it's not gonna be comforting. Um, it may be a bit depressing, uh, but in my view, understanding the scope of a problem is the first step towards taking steps towards resolving it, um, and so that's the journey I'm gonna take you on. Now, let me start at the very beginning, and I'm sure for many of you, particularly if you're engaged in this issue, this is uh, stuff you understand well, but let me work my way through it just to tell you where I'm coming from. The problem of accumulating carbon dioxide in the atmosphere uh, is a little bit like water building up in a bathtub. And let me say from the outset that the issue of climate change is not the same thing as the issue of accumulating carbon dioxide. There's a lot of human forcings of the climate system. Um, we could deal with the carbon dioxide problem and still have a human cause climate change problem. But uh, for many reasons, scientists and policymakers have decided that carbon dioxide is the primary forcing element that we ought to be focused on. That's why I'm gonna focus on it in this talk. Um, we're putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, mainly by the burning of fossil fuels, some land use changes. Um, and from the perspective of policy, um, that carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere, you know, it might as well be forever. It's not forever, but it's a little bit like saying, you know, the water you put in your bathtub doesn't stay there forever either. It evaporates eventually, but on the time scale of the bathtub filling up, that doesn't help you very much. Um, we measure the amount of 
carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, according to it, it's parts per million, molecules per million. Um, we're about 390 parts per million now. One of the questions that the scientific community has debated is, how, how high is our bathtub? Um, when, when does it overflow and cause damage to our home? Uh, and that two degree number that I referenced that comes from the European Union climate policy it has been equated to 450 parts per million. And not long ago, a number of advocates, a number of scientists said, well, if you tell people that danger occurs at 450 and we're at 390, many people will just say, okay, give me a call when it's 449. Um, more recently, you've had people um, focused on the number 350. Jim Hansen, the NASA scientist, um, Bill McKibben in the US has started a group called 350.org. But there's a debate about whether our bathtub is, uh, overflows at 450 or 350. One of the points of my talk is going to be to uh, try to convince you that that threshold is largely irrelevant or should be irrelevant to climate policy. Um, there's some good news and bad news. Uh, there's a hole in the bottom of our bathtub. Uh, some of the carbon dioxide that we're putting into the atmosphere is being taken up by the land surface, by soils, by trees, uh, and, but a lot of it's being taken up by the oceans. Um, and so if, from the perspective of the atmosphere, that's good news, because the atmospheric concentrations are rising lower than they might otherwise be. Uh, from the perspective of the oceans, that might be bad news, because we're changing the chemistry of the oceans, which could have negative consequences. So the mathematics of the bathtub are really straightforward. If you want your water in the bathtub to stop rising, you don't want it to overflow, then the amount going in has to equal the amount going out. That'll stabilize the water in the bathtub. If you don't want to use the oceans as a giant sponge to take up CO2, then the amount going in has to essentially go down to zero, very close to zero. So the amount of emissions we're putting into the atmosphere has to go down very close to zero. Now, by the time that we do that, we'll dictate how high this water gets in the bathtub. And so the question is, how quickly can we stop the water increasing in the bathtub? And that's the simple math I want to go through um, in my presentation and talk about the policy options for limiting the increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now, let's start looking at some data. So this is emissions. The black dots are observations. This is gigatons of carbon. Um, I'll explain the colorful lines here in a second. One of the things you see is this dip. Emissions went down during the global financial crisis. And immediately thereafter, the largest single year-on-year -year increase in carbon dioxide uh, emissions worldwide. When we're back on the, this line. You'll notice that the observations, the black line, are at the upper end of these colorful curves. In 2000, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change put out a number of scenarios for future emissions. Um, and we are running at the, near the upper end, not exceeding the upper, but near the upper end of those scenarios um, for a number of reasons, which I'll discuss. Um, but one thing I want to point out, if you, if you can look at this graph and, and, and think about the slopes of the lines, you'll see that the line is a little bit steeper after about 2002 than it was before. During the era that we are most concerned about climate change, during the Kyoto Protocol era, where policymakers are paying the most attention, the most legislation has been passed, the rate of increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has gone up, not down. Um, so this is suggesting that for all the talk, for all the rhetoric, for all the uh, supposed action, um, we are not bending the curve, so to speak, on uh, emissions. So I'm gonna give you a framework for thinking about policy related to uh, dealing with emissions. And I mean this when I say this, that in this simple sentence I have here is every possible policy option for, for stopping that water increasing in the bathtub. You can amaze your friends, go to cocktail parties, dazzle people, um, because you can encompass every single tool in the toolbox with this sentence. Uh, people engage in economic activity that uses energy from carbon emitting generation. So I put this sentence on four lines for a reason. Here's the sentence, we can turn it into variables. Population, GDP, which is just economic activity per capita. The energy intensity of our economy. So it's the total energy we consume. Here's the variable, total energy divided by our GDP, divided by our economic activity. And the carbon intensity of energy. So how much carbon or carbon dioxide is emitted per unit of energy consumption out there. Now, these terms together are what's called the Kaya identity. It's named after the Japanese scientist Yoichi Kaya, who first formulated it. Um, 
he, pre, he put it together in the late 1980s um, to come up with emission scenarios to feed into climate models. If you want to know what the future climate's going to do, you have to know something about emissions. If you want to know something about emissions, you have to know something about population, wealth, energy consumption, carbon intensity. Um, so it's an identity. It's a little bit like saying bread is made up of flour, water, yeast, a little oil. Um, it, it doesn't give you anything prescriptive, but it does tell you where carbon emissions come from. Um, in an identity, it's always nice that the units match up. You can Google the Kaya identity. It's the subject of an increasing number of, of academic studies, um, not just for producing scenarios of future emissions, but for policy analysis. And it, from where I sit um, as a policy scholar, the Kaya identity is an incredibly powerful tool for doing policy analysis related to carbon dioxide. The Kaya identity tells us what tools we have in the toolbox. So you take these four variables, and it tells us what levers we have to influence carbon dioxide emissions. Now, let me be very clear. This is it. If you want to influence carbon dioxide emissions, these are all the tools in the toolbox. I'm not hiding anything behind the screen. There's nothing that's hidden. These are all the tools that we have. So here's, here's what we could do. Um, so less people, all else equal, means lower emissions. A smaller economy, all else equal, means less emissions. We could increase efficiency. So that means doing the same or more with less energy. It's important to note, this doesn't mean doing less. Um, if you decide not to go to work one day and stay in bed, um, you might be conserving energy, but you're not making anything more efficient. Um, and then the fourth tool in the toolbox is, uh, is improving our carbon intensity, which is switching energy sources. Uh, we could go from a very carbon intensive coal-fired power plant to gas. You could go from gas to, uh, to wind or solar or nuclear. Um, but this is it. These are the four different levers we have in the toolbox. Now, for the purpose of analysis and for our discussion here today, I'm going to make it even simpler. I'm going to combine population and per capita wealth. This is just GDP. This is just our economic activity. And I'm going to combine energy intensity and carbon intensity um, and call this technology. These are technologies of energy production, power plants, solar panels, and so on, and technologies of energy consumption, lights, power plant projectors, cars, airplanes, and so on. Now, in my book, I introduce um, a concept that has kind of taken off and people talk about it a lot, um, which I think is absolutely key to understanding um, why we are where we are with respect to climate policy. And I, I call it you know, a little bit tongue in cheek, but uh, but there's some seriousness here, the iron law of climate policy. Um, and it's illustrated with this graph, which is from an opinion poll taken of US citizens um, after the Waxman-Markey cap and trade bill passed the House of Representatives in the summer of 2009. And they basically asked people, would you, su would you support a generic climate bill if the annual cost per household was $80, $175, $770? And what you see here is a characteristic curve that exists everywhere in the world in varying degrees that at a relatively low price, there's more support. And in the US, there was a majority of support at $80 per year. And at a higher price, there's less support at about 10% at $770. Um, and the iron law of climate policy simply says that people are willing to pay some amount for environmental objectives, including climate change, but that willingness has its limits. Um, and everywhere I give talks about this, I ask the audience, I said, you know, if it was $1 a year for climate policy, how many of you would support it? Let's see your hands. All right, look, look around, a lot of people. All right, if it was a million dollars a year, how many of you would support it or could support it? <laughs> come, come see me about my center endowment. <laughs> Obviously, much less. Um, and people often say, well, people in Europe pay a lot more for petrol than they do in the United States and, and so on. And of course, the numbers vary, but the shape of this curve, I would say, is the same everywhere. And not just because of preferences, but because people have certain ability to pay. Now, if there's one ideological commitment, I would say, that is shared around the world in different cultures, people of different religions and different political systems. It's a commitment to economic growth. Um, and this is an empirical observation. Um, efforts to contract GDP, noticeably slow it down, are not policy options that you see very many policymakers openly advocating. In fact, I would argue that policymakers 
everywhere in the world are focused these days on how do we get GDP growth back up to where it was before the global financial crisis. Um, and they see that very much as uh, the key to keeping their citizens happy, winning re-election, and so on. So one of the things that I um, argue is that a boundary condition for policy design, if we're gonna deal with carbon dioxide emissions, is that climate policies must not cost too much. And better yet, they should actually foster economic growth. Uh, there is a lot of talk about trade-offs between environment and economy, and I think the only way we deal with this problem is in fact if environment and economy move in the same direction. Now let me, let me make this a little bit more complicated. If I was giving a talk about development and global poverty, um, I might put this slide up in which I would show that with respect to the Millennium Development Goals of poverty around the world, which is measured on the number of people who live on $1.25 a day or less or a dollar a day, um, there has been great progress. We are ahead of goal. With respect to the Millennium Development Goal, um, there are less people living in poverty today than there were um, even a decade or two decades ago. Why is this? According to the Brookings Institution, um, these new estimates of global poverty presented in this brief show, serve as a reminder of just how powerful high growth can be in freeing people from poverty. High growth in the context of carbon dioxide emissions is a bane, it's, a, it's causing more emissions. In the context of poverty, it's reducing poverty. Right away you can see we have a situation where the material demands, wants, needs, however you want to characterize it, of so-called developing countries are squarely up against the desire by many people in rich countries to limit emissions. Because of that Kaya identity, GDP is a key factor there. It's no wonder that China and India are steadfast in their refusal to reduce emissions um, because they very much see GDP growth as their priority. Now this curve, this is one of the more interesting graphs I've seen in my career, and I, you, know, you can look at it for a long time, but what it shows is estimate from um, the UN, it was part of the uh, Millennium Development Goal project. Um, it shows a pretty, I would say, rough estimate of the distribution of income around the world for three points in time. This dark curve is 1970, uh, we have 2000, the dotted line, and the blue curve is 2015. Um, it shows for different, kind of normalized income levels. One of the things that you see in this curve is a movement from the left to the right. The world is getting wealthier. People have more income. Again, if you're in development and poverty reduction, you say, well, this is success, this is good news. Um, if you're in climate change, you say, wow, we're, we're, we're working against a headwind. So the question I ask people is, is, where do you think this curve is going to be in the future, five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now? Um, and what, do you, what steps do you think policymakers are going to be taking to shape this curve? Um, the argument I would make, just based on an empirical observation, is that policymakers and publics around the world are going to be working very hard to try to push this curve to the right, to continue to accumulate wealth. Um, a few markers for you. 80% of the world lives on less than $10 a day. So that's 90% of the so-called developing world. Now when I go talk at university campuses, and I've talked at university campuses across North America, across Europe, um, elsewhere. Faculty members always want to talk about the need to reduce consumption, the need to limit GDP growth as a tool of climate policy. And let me say, it's very easy to have those sorts of discussions when you are way out on the front of the curve. And if you think about the mathematics here, that to reduce emissions appreciably, to uh, stabilize that water in the bathtub, we're talking about 80% you know, or more reduction in emissions, um, how much poorer would you be willing to be to achieve that goal? 5%, 10%, 80%? Um, the reality is that GDP, modulating GDP, uh, is not a tool for reducing emissions, much less stabilizing them. Um, and again, I say that as an empirical observation. People love to debate it, I'm happy to debate it. Um, I don't see very many people out there running for office on a platform of GDP contraction. Um, if you, people would like to try it, they can report back to me how successful they are. So you can see right away, here's the problem that we have. That, that we often in the climate debate, we talk about emissions. We talk about emissions as if they're abstracted from everything else in, in the world. But emissions are tied to economic activity and technology. But what I've just told you, what I've just argued is that 
if we want to make emissions go down, we, we don't have GDP as an option. In fact, I would argue that if we're trying to get GDP to go up, which I think policymakers are do, doing around the world, and at the same time they're trying to get emissions to go down, it's, it's no wonder emissions keep going up. Because if there is a battle between GDP and emissions, then GDP will win every single time. So to, to deal with this, I suggest analytic, analytically, we use the magic of mathematics and get our incentives all lined up as a starting point for analysis. And by that, I mean that the only way we're gonna deal with the emissions issue and stabilize emissions is through technology. And the proper measure of our progress with respect to technology, insofar as carbon dioxide is concerned, is this ratio of emissions to GDP. We want that ratio to go down. It's, we want emissions to go down, GDP to go up. That puts our incentives all together. Um, that's a sign that we're advancing technology. Now, it's not enough to simply say this ratio has to go down. Remember that water in the bathtub. It's, it's mathematically possible, you can just believe me on this, that this ratio goes down and emissions go up forever. Um, so we have some targets. We want to stabilize at a certain level. So let me, let me present some, some real world data on this ratio and use that as the basis for talking about the magnitude of the problem and the different options we have for dealing with it. Um, so when I wrote the book, um, the latest data that was available on an apples to apples basis was through 2006, which actually proved kind of fortunate for my analysis, not for the world, because after the global financial crisis, we were right back at 2006 levels in about 2009. Um, so what we want to do is we want to decarbonize our economy. So I'm going to introduce this term decarbonization. Um, in 2006, we were about 0.62 tons of carbon dioxide per thousand dollars of global GDP. And we want to reduce this to a level that's consistent with our stabilization targets. And by stabilization target, 450 parts per million, 350 parts per million. Um, you might be a pre-industrial 280 parts per million person. Um, I'm going to argue from a policy perspective, it doesn't matter. Because the, the, the actions we would take to try to achieve any of those stabilization targets are essentially the same. If we can stabilize at 450, I would argue we're, we're most of the way to stabilize them to 350. Um, so the numbers that I use here are consistent with an 80% reduction by 2050, which is um, consistent with a 350 parts per million, certainly consistent with 450. So let me give you some good news. This may be the last good news of the talk. Um, the global economy has been decarbonizing all on its own for more than a century. We are producing energy with less carbon content. Um, we are becoming more efficient. And the amount of carbon dioxide per unit of GDP has gone down dramatically and significantly um, for about 100 years, maybe a little bit over 100 years. Now, the good news ends because at some point in the last decade, you can see if you're paying close attention, that it flattened out a bit. And What's a little worrisome is in the last two years, certainly, it's actually gone back up as co countries in Europe, the United States, China have become more carbon intensive. Um, but what we're talking about with decarbonizing our economy is accelerating a process that has been in place for a long time. We're not talking about doing something fundamentally new. Um, if there is a very bright upside to the, uh, the, the new uh, penetration of coal seam gas or shale gas uh, into the global energy mix is that it will displace a lot of coal, particularly in the United States, and perhaps get this trend moving in the right direction again. So here's 2006.62. So we can ask a policy analysis question. We could say, what would this curve have to look like if we want to reduce emissions by 80% by 2050? And if you like 90% or 95% or even 50% it's not going to make a difference to where I end up. It's, my analysis is insensitive to that. So I'm going to use 80%. It's an aggressive number. Um, and I pick it because it's used in international discussions. Now, you know already from the Kaya identity to answer this question, we have to specify some rate of future GDP growth. I don't know what future GDP growth will be. Um, if I did, I probably wouldn't be a college professor. But what I'll do is I'll give you three different or five different numbers from 1% to 5%. Um, I'll give you an anchor point. So from 1980 to 2006, it was about 3.5% per year. The projections going forward are somewhere around 3.5% globally. Uh, but in, in one sense, it doesn't matter. Um, 
all of the values wind up below 0.1. Um, in, an, in an absolute sense, it absolutely does matter because the top one's about five times the bottom one. Um, but the question then is, what does it mean to, to get our decarbonization rate down below 0.1? These are just abstractions. They're just numbers. What does it actually mean? This is no better than that um, integrated assessment model performance art picture I put up at the beginning. So what I'd like to do is walk you through an exercise to get an intuitive understanding for what these numbers actually mean and then how it translates back into technology. So here's the historical decarbonization rate, the black curve with a little hiccup at the end with just stapling, stapling on the, the midpoint of uh, the future rate. I'm gonna start with the United Kingdom um, as a case study and we'll work out globally from there. Uh, I picked the United Kingdom because the UK has the most aggressive national legislation of any large economy for emissions reductions. Um, and it provides a, a, a useful starting point. If you are a, a leader in policy, you often get applauded in international negotiations and the climate community, um, but you also find policy analysts looking at what you're doing and evaluating it, and so that's what I'm going to do. So here's the same numbers for the United Kingdom. This is the historical decarbonization of the UK economy. You see this characteristic downward curve that you see in most advanced large industrial economies. Um, the UK is actually one of the more carbon efficient economies uh, worldwide. They're about 50% better than the global average. They're at 0.42 tons of carbon dioxide per thousand dollars of GDP. Now, some of the reason for that is that uh, the UK has lost a lot of its manufacturing. They've offshored their emissions. So this is the, the contribution of manufacturing to the UK economy, dropping from about 33% to about 12% um, from 1970 to 2007. This is the employment that's followed that same path. Um, so I would argue that if, in fact, the offshoring of manufacturing is responsible for the, the continued decrease in the carbon intensity of the UK economy, that's not a particularly sustainable approach to reducing emissions, and it just displaces them from one place to another. Um, the Climate Change Act of 2008 was passed in December 2008 um, in the UK, mandates that the UK has to reduce its aggregate emissions from a 1990 level by 34% by 2022. Um, we can take that number and say, all right, if we reduce emissions by 34% for different rates of GDP, what would the decarbonization curve have to be for the United Kingdom? Here's the, the decarbonization curves for the UK, going from the 0.42 down somewhere between 0.2 and 0.15. Now, I should say, um, the UK hasn't cooperated with my analysis that they've had actually GDP contraction in a number of years since I first did this study. Um, I can tell you that David Cameron would be doing backflips of joy for positive GDP growth. Um, it is quite possible that if the UK economy collapses and they disappear, they may meet their emissions reductions targets. But for any positive GDP growth, um, this is the range in which they would have to be um, for decarbonization. So 0.15 to 0.2, what I'd like to do is to present to you what this actually means from the standpoint of technology. Now here's a number of different countries. Um, you can see who the winner is there in terms of carbon intensity. Um, it's France. Uh, France is at 0.3, and why does France have such a low carbon intensity? Nuclear power. Um, why does France have nuclear power? It has something to do with the Suez crisis and the reliance on uh, fossil fuels that have to come from the east. It has to do with Germany. It has to do with national security. It has to do with a lot of things. It doesn't have anything to do with climate change. Um, but they have this very low carbon intensity. And the point I'd like to make is that if the UK is going to go from their 0.42 down below 0.2, they have to go through 0.3. So, so France is a milestone on the way for the UK to achieve its carbon reduction targets in terms of decarbonization and allows us to, to ask, well, what would it take for the United Kingdom to be as carbon efficient as France? Here's the French decarbonization curve. It's downward, much smaller slope. Um, and if you ask the question, well, how long did it take France to go from 0.42 to 0.3? The answer is 20 years. So we know empirically it is possible for a large economy 
to go from 0.42 to 0.3. It took 20 years. The question is, is it possible for the UK to do it in a shorter time period? Um, what if we're worried about climate change and we want to modulate carbon intensity? Can we do that? What would that take? So in this graph, what I have is I have the French, uh, the French 0.3 here. Here's the decarbonization curves for the UK. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put France in motion to answer the question, by when would the UK have to be as carbon efficient as France? So follow along. So we take France over to where it intersects the curve. I'll be generous here. Drop it down. And if you squint and make it blurry, you can say 2015. Let's say 2015. So in the next three years, less than three years now, uh, the UK would have to become as carbon efficient as France to be on target to meeting the provisions of the, the 2008 Climate Change Act. What does that mean in terms of technology? One of the things I try to do um, in my work is to, is to provide an intuitive understanding of, of what these numbers actually mean. If I tell you they have to be as carbon efficient as France, all right, that tells you something, but it doesn't tell you something that you intuitively understand. Certainly, I don't intuitively understand it. So what I'm gonna do is give you a measuring stick. This is the Dungeness B nuclear power plant in Kent, in the uh, southeast coast of England. It's a one gigawatt nuclear power plant. And what I'm going to do is ask the question, how many Dungeness B nuclear power plants equivalent would have to be built and deployed in the UK displacing an equivalent amount of energy produced by coal in order to be as carbon efficient as France in the next three years. Now I wanna make something very clear because sometimes when I talk about nuclear power plants, people don't hear anything I say for the rest of my talk. This is simply a measuring stick. I'm not saying anything about nuclear power. We all understand intuitively the size of a nuclear power plant. So I will present some numbers in terms of solar uh, solar farms shortly in the context of Australia. Um, I f when I first several years ago presented some of this analysis, early analysis um, in Australia, I had a comment from the audience. Someone said, well, well, obviously your analysis doesn't make sense because we don't do nuclear power in Australia. So, so just to be clear, I'm not saying anything about nuclear power. So you're all sitting down. You guys might want to sit down for the answer. Here's the answer. The answer is the equivalent amount of energy of 40 Dungeness B nuclear power plants have to be deployed by 2015. Now, I presented this in the UK and the Climate Change Committee, a few members of the Climate Change Committee said, you know, they criticized this analysis, say, well, you're not being fair. We have a report that's this thick that says all the things we can do in the UK with insulation, with changing to electric cars, with efficiency improvements, with wind farms onshore and offshore. My reply to that, that's fine. The magnitude of effort is the same whether you express it in nuclear power plants or giant thick reports this thick. It's like, it's like kilograms and pounds. You could say I lost, you know, I lost 22 pounds and to say, well, it was only 10 kilograms. That's not, the mag, this is a measuring stick. And so I have gone out on a limb in my work and I've said the UK is going to fail miserably in meeting their emissions reductions targets for any positive GDP growth. Now, I gave this talk in 2009, actually, almost three years ago to today, um, at a big talk in Birmingham, and one of the advantages of giving a, a prominent talk is that it gets covered by the media, and they ask, actually, people who matter what they think about it. So I asked Colin Challen, who's a member of the UK Parliament at the time in charge of their Climate Change Committee, um, and he actually read my paper. He said, you know, Pelkey's analysis raises questions which I do not think have been factored into the thinking behind the Climate Change Act. The task of cutting emissions is already staggeringly huge, as we have seen, well beyond our current political capacity to deliver. So that's good. He understood what I was saying and the implications. Um, then he talks about Heathrow. I'll get back to Heathrow in a minute. Um, but here's where I think we have some problems in our discussions about climate change, is that when we get to the point where information becomes uncomfortable or unwelcome, um, we have an, an almost an, an antibody approach. We, we kind of reject the information. This goes on the climate science. We see people who are skeptical of the, even the idea of human-caused climate change, but we also see it in the policy realm also. So when in that same BBC article, um, we see this statement, Professor Pelkey's intervention was rejected by economist Terry Barker, a lead author for the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. Um, those of you who follow my work will know that I have been critical of the IPCC 
on a number of fronts, which has earned me the great distinction of climate skeptic. Uh, I will point out that just several months ago, this was in The Guardian, Britain will miss government carbon targets by increasingly wide margins over the next 20 years, argues Cambridge Econometrics, a private company owned by a charity and chaired by Cambridge University academic Terry Barker. So I think there are things we may wish to be the case. It would be great if climate change were a hoax and it wasn't real. It's not. It would be great if we had easy solutions to the problem. We don't. They're difficult. Um, let me present a couple slides to give you some context beyond the UK. I just did this last week. Um, you'll see the, this is dated 23rd of January. The US government put out its projection of US emissions. This just came out last week, um, out to 2030. And the US has these targets for emissions reduction, 17%, the red line, 30%, the blue line, 42% um, is the green line. And what I did is I simply calculated the number of nuclear power plants equivalent in the same manner as I did for the UK for the US to meet its targets. US has a much bigger economy. To meet its 2020 emissions reductions, it's 103 nuclear power plants equivalent. It's not gonna happen. The US government no longer talks about emissions reduction targets. In fact, it, it is perfectly willing to put out projections that don't even come close to meeting the targets and no one even criticizes them in the US anymore. It's, it's so commonly accepted. Um, this would be 13 plants annually. Um, to 2020, if you really want to reduce for the 2030 target, that's 20 nuclear power plants annually to 2030. Right now, the US has plans for two. Um, so they're about 353 short. <laughs> so how about Australia? This figure comes from the official uh, most recent government document projecting Australian emissions with respect to the emissions reductions targets in Australia, which you can see are quite a bit more severe. The US says 17%, but that's 17% below 2005. Australia says 5%, but that's 5% below 1990. You have to keep your eye on the P. Um, and we can do the same sort of analysis for Australia. So the number of uh, 750 megawatt nuclear power plants equivalent to meet Australia's 2020 targets. 5% below, it's 25 nuclear power plants equivalent. It's not going to happen. Australia is not going to meet its emission reductions goal. Now, it's possible that there's some dodgy thing called offsets and a few billion dollars might be spent to have an accounting success, but that's not the same as decarbonizing the economy. Now, in the spirit that Australia doesn't do nuclear power, I have uh, a solar energy example. In my book, um, when I wrote it, I, I, one of the things I wanted to do was to um, use technologies that exist as my intuitive examples. So I used the Cloncurry solar thermal uh, plant that was a 10 megawatt plant that by all indications it was gonna go forward. It didn't. Um, so Australia's example doesn't exist. So I, I recently looked up um, and saw that the Cloncurry solar thermal plant has been turned into a, a wind, or a, sorry, a solar farm. Um, it has 7,600 solar panels. These, here's an example of what those panels look like. And we could ask, how many of these solar farms would Australia have to deploy, again, replacing an equivalent amount of a coal energy um, to meet the 5%, 15%, 25% target? Here's the answer. <laughs> so about 10 of these solar farms per day between now and 2020 would be enough to hit that 5% target. Um, by my estimate, the, Australia is going to be about 29,860 short. Um, the, the point here is to give you a very real and intuitive sense for the magnitude of what we've signed up for. Um, the point isn't to make you optimistic or pe pessimistic. That's, that's, when you wake up in the morning, you're either optimistic or pessimistic. I don't have control over that. My view as a policy analyst is that we are never going to make progress on difficult policy problems unless we understand what we're up against. Um, and so these are daunting numbers. They're huge numbers. My view very much is that the answer to the question, how do we stabilize carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the only appropriate answer is we don't know. But we might know enough to get started in the right direction. So let me start moving out again and start talking about how we start moving in the right direction. Um, there's a debate, there was a debate in the UK over building a third runway at Heathrow. If you've been through Heathrow, you know it's not really the most effective airport. Um, 
Here are some Greenpeace campaigners on the back of a BA jet um, climate emergency, no third runway. Why don't they want a third runway? More economic activity, more airplanes, more emissions. Um, I think David Cameron has solved this by saying he's gonna build another airport somewhere else. Um, but the point here is there's a lot of well-meaning people with the best of intentions on the climate issue who are spending time doing things like this to absolutely no effect and perhaps even generating some ill will towards um, the cause of reducing emissions. I'm sure the people who are looking out these windows are not too amused um, that their flight's gonna be delayed because there's a bunch of guys on the wing. Now, while this is happening in the UK, here's what's happening in China. China is building, by 2020, 100 new airports, Heathrow size and larger. In a, in, a, in a very real sense, it does not matter what happens to that third runway at Heathrow. Um, it is irrelevant. Let's see it go even broader. Here's China's emissions in 2006, 1.7 gigatons of carbon. What I've done here is have the estimated 2010 emissions um, with each year's increments. You can see how fast it's growing. And what I've done here is put the annual emissions for a bunch of countries. There's Australia at the very top. Um, so you can compare how they compare to, to what's going on in China. Um, the UK is about three weeks worth of China's annual emissions or about you know, a, a third of their annual increment. Australia might be a week worth of China's emissions. Uh, again, mathematically, you could say, well, it doesn't really matter what happens in the UK at all either. Now, the response to that is, well, every little bit helps. Um, and certainly that's true in one sense, but if you need 29,868 uh, solar farms, um, putting up one at a time, you may say every little bit helps, but it doesn't get you anywhere near the scale of the problem. Now, what I'm presenting here is not new. Um, what might be new here is an intuitive way to, to comprehend it and an unavoidable way to comprehend it. This is from Ken Caldera, Marty Hoffert, and colleagues in Science in 2003. They wrote, to achieve stabilization at a two degree warming, we need to install 900 plus or minus 500 megawatts, so that's a, a nuclear power plant, of carbon emissions free power generating capacity each day over the next 50 years, every day. This is roughly the equivalent of a large carbon emissions free power plant becoming functional somewhere in the world every day. We are not doing this. So what I'm presenting should not be viewed as heretical or um, not consistent with the literature that's out there. Now there's a wild card. While I'm talking about this, there are 1.5 billion people who lack access to electricity, and probably another billion who lack access to reliable electricity. Um, one of the, the, what I would call, dirty little secrets of the climate change issue is that almost all of the so-called success scenarios, the stabilization scenarios at 450 parts per million or 350 parts per million, keep almost all of these people in the dark. Why is that? Because if you were to add 1.5 billion people to the global economy with full energy access, it blows up our carbon budgets. We cannot do that. So if you look at integrated assessment models from the IPCC, from the IEA, and other groups, um, and you look at the, what the numbers say in the fine print, um, in 2030, there's still 1.3 billion people without access to electricity. Now, if you're in India, and you're a scholar, you're in the climate issue, and you look at this, is that something you're gonna sign on for? Probably not. Right now, there's an, a quiet debate that's probably going to emerge full-throated soon, um, that this year, you may or may not know this, this is the, the International Year of Sustainable Energy for All. It used to be the International Year of Energy for All. There's a big debate over the sustainable part. What if it's possible to give energy access to 600 million Indians, um, but they require fossil fuels? Is that appropriate? Is that not appropriate? How does that work? Um, so this is the trade-off that is, is out there. Um, if anything, the estimates for how much energy the world will need in the coming decades have been underestimated, making this problem even worse um, in terms of the amount of energy that needs to be provided. So I would argue that we have gone down the wrong path on the climate change issue. Um, the narrative, the very common narrative, is that we use too much energy and fossil fuels are too cheap. If that's how you define the problem, then the solution follows from that. We need to use less energy, and we need to make fossil fuels more expensive. What about if we looked at it a different way? And we said, well, if you look at the world, there's gonna be continued economic growth. There's a lot of people who don't have access to energy. 
just like us, deserve that energy access to it. What about we need vastly more energy, vastly more energy in years to come. And part of the problem with providing more energy is that fossil fuels are too expensive. We need alternatives to fossil fuels that are cheaper. That makes us more efficient, helps with economic growth. So the question you might ask is how fast can decarbonization of the economy occur? And as I suggest, nobody knows. If you look historically uh, around the world, there has been these rates, what you might call background rates of one to 2% decarbonization per year. Um, I had my students uh, a while back canvas the globe, look at um, decarbonization rates in every country around the world and ask for, for large developed economies, what's the fastest rate of decarbonization over a five year or longer period? It was 1981 to 1986 in Japan, 4.4% per year. Um, Japan offshored its aluminum industry, which was a big energy hog, which also wasn't too profitable and helped GDP also. Um, to take an example for the United States, achieving a 17% reduction, which they're not gonna hit, um, while maintaining modest economic growth requires rates of decarbonization in excess of 5% a year. We do not know how to do this. Um, I think policy wisdom starts with that, that simple truth. So what about the current policy options? Um, the policy logic of targets and timetables is backwards. It, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever to set targets for things we don't know how to do. Um, cap and trade cannot succeed. Uh, the European experience should tell you that. If you look at my book, I have some numbers in there that compare the pre-Kyoto period to the post-Kyoto period for rates of decarbonization in Europe. There was no change. In the last several years, Europe has actually recarbonized. Um, what cap and trade did in Europe is it took this background rate of decarbonization, um, which no one was paying attention to before climate policy. Uh, we started paying attention to it and then called it climate policy, but it didn't change. Uh, we were still achieving that background rate. Now, a carbon tax for the same reason can't do the job. Uh, but I think a carbon tax is incredibly important if it's used wisely. Um, and just to give you a sense of, of the policy um, recommendation that I have in the book, which is not original to me, but it's from a group of scholars that I'm associated with, um, is that if we put a low carbon tax, and how low, I don't know, as high as politically possible, $5 a ton, $2 a ton, $15 a ton, I don't know. Um, but at some level, um, and the good thing about the energy economy of the world is that it's enormous. Um, it's, it's something like you know, five to $10 trillion. So a small carbon tax, could be an oil tax, raises an enormous amount of money. You take that money and you invest in energy innovation with the goal of driving down the costs of alternatives to fossil fuels. Um, how do we deal with other so-called wicked problems? I'll just talk about one, advancing human lifespans. At the end of my book, I have this tongue-in-cheek, smart aleck little example, and I say, what if, what if we wanted to advance human lifespans? One way we could do that is put a, is put a limit on the number of deaths that each country is allowed. They would then get permits for the number of deaths that they were allowed to have, and if they exceeded them, they would have to pay a price, and they could trade their permits around the world. Um, and people laugh, but that would motivate all sorts of research to advance uh, public health and disease. It's the same logic we're applying to energy, but nobody laughs when you talk about energy. We control emissions in the same way that we control human lifespans. It's an outcome of other processes that we do control. What we do control are the carbon intensity of energy that we generate and energy efficiency, just like we control progress on disease and public health. Um, so we do not know how fast we can decarbonize. There's no guarantees. Um, but if you think about carbon taxes and cap and trade, in principle, they are supposed to motivate investments and innovation that will revolutionize the energy sector. The argument I would make is if we want to revolutionize the energy sector, let's step aside from these convoluted, politically contentious policies and just cut to the chase and figure out how to raise money to invest in tomorrow's energy. Um, I will conclude here, and we maybe have time for a few questions. Um, this is a, a map of the world from space from Jesse Ausubel, um, and he asked the question, well, what would this map look like? This is at night, you see the lights. What would this map look like if uh, everyone around the world lived at the level of uh, North Americans, Europeans? That's this world. I show this to my students. We have a long discussion. Somebody first starts out and says, what a nightmare. Think of all those CO2 emissions. 
Someone else says, well, think of all the human potential freed up by energy access in sub-Saharan Africa and in India. Um, one thing I'm pretty convinced of um, is that this is the world we're headed for, one way or another, and that we're going to go into this world intelligently, smart, um, or we're not. And energy is going to be a big part of that equation. Um, here's how you can find me. I welcome feedback, comments, criticisms. Um, Pelkey at colorado.edu. There's a lot of papers um, at sciencepolicy.colorado.edu that um, you can download for free from our center website. Um, right now, I'm working on a book on motivated by where I wound up on the climate fix on innovation broadly, how we drive innovation, how we control innovation, how we deal with the downsides. And so my blogging a lot these days is about innovation, much less about climate policy, thank goodness. Um, but you can find me talking about different topics, and you're welcome to participate there. Um, thank you very much for your attention in this long talk. <laughs>
we are producing 95% of our energy from carbon-free sources, we're pretty close to stabilizing. Now, think about this. We spend an enormous amount of money and effort trying to count carbon and to account for carbon. I would ask you, go to the web sometime in the next few days and try to find a site that can, will tell you, one-stop shop, how much of the world's energy comes from carbon-free sources. No one pays any attention to that. Yeah, there's some experts and you can go out and find it. It's, depending on how you count hydropower, it's about 10%, plus or minus 5%. We need to go up to 95%. Um, my view is w that's the metric we ought to be paying attention to, not the output measure, which is the carbon measure. Yeah, um, look, just one of, uh, let me start out by saying I really uh, support the kind of uh, approach and, and analysis you've got. And I think one of the things that we've uh, had trouble with in Australia is getting a, a handle on how big 5% is. Yes. We've had obviously quite a contentious debate about that and there are certainly people who would count themselves in the climate change uh, advocacy area who think that's a pathetically small number and it should be a lot bigger. And um, obviously there, there is an engineering challenge there which you know, many of us uh, are aware of and, and your analysis shows quite dramatically that 5% is actually a huge number. And there's absolutely no way we're going to meet it, even with the carbon tax. Absolutely no way. Um, so, I mean, some reflections on how you actually manage that kind of a debate um, might be useful. And um, perhaps also how, how you can reflect on your experiences in this, in this kind of analysis that you're presenting, which basically says we're not doing technology innovation nearly, nearly fast enough to get anywhere near any of these targets. And yet people keep talking about even more ambitious targets. Right. Yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, Australia is a fascinating case for a lot of reasons. Um, I mean, Australia shows that, that, you know, the politics are difficult, but for now there's a carbon tax that's proposed and maybe will be implemented. Um, I, I wrote a, a critique of uh, Julia Gillard's climate policy in ABC News, you can Google it, it's on our website, um, with kind of a, a half and half appraisal. The, the idea of the carbon tax, good idea. Um, it should be done. Um, tying the carbon tax to tax policy and refunding that money, probably not a good idea, maybe politically a good idea, maybe tax policy a good idea, but from the standpoint of energy innovation, um, the, the pricing of a carbon tax will have marginal impacts on people's energy use. Um, if you've been to Europe and you look at uh, the kind of cars people drive in Europe and how much they pay for petrol, or even here in Australia compared to the United States, um, there's some differences, but there's not uh, highways full of electric cars in Europe. Um, and they pay five, six times the amount you might see in the US. So the ability to use pricing as a mechanism of stimulating innovation runs into a problem. You put a price on carbon, it causes certain goods to become more expensive, which causes people then to motivate to search for other goods or stimulate innovation, but it also pisses people off because they pay more money and they vote for somebody else. So the, the, the downside, the critique of the Australian climate policy is that the, the money that was raised from the carbon tax um, is not earmarked for energy innovation. And that I would suspect in 2020, under a fully successful regime of a carbon tax, um, Australia is gonna look a lot like it does now um, with a fossil fuel infrastructure. So at some point, we're going to have to build that energy bridge to the future. Um, and it's gonna to have to be paid for. We do this in a lot of areas. Um, in the United States, there's a, a highway tax, a gasoline tax that people pay, even in the tax-unfriendly U.S., for the national highway system, which people love the national highway system. Part of the reason is that it raises half a trillion dollars every year that members of Congress get to spend in their district for jobs to build highways. Um, and so if you were to say, let's get rid of that gasoline tax, there would be an outcry <laughs> from people all across the U.S. because they tie it to something they value. If Energy, uh, an energy tax, a carbon tax, were used to raise money that were in, reinvested back into R&D, um, not just R&D, but broader innovation, with this idea that there are countries around the world who need to buy a lot of kit to install a lot of goods for energy. Um, the countries that have that technology, that capability, will probably win contracts to do so. That means jobs, that means money. Um, I think there's, there's a better way to, to to try to crack this nut than to simply say we're going to make energy more expensive and that will drive innovation. 
Okay, we'll take one last question up the end over there, and uh, after which we'll bring the session to a close. Can I uh, encourage you all to stay back? We've got some light, ref light refreshments outside and uh, interact with Professor Pilkey uh, further. Uh, thank you. Uh, Roger, I'm going to draw not on your current book, but on your previous book, The Honest Broker. Now, um, in your presentation tonight, you've talked about changing the narrative, and you're addressing an audience of university academics and a few CSIRO academics as well, scientists. Um, and the university, Australian National University has a Centre for Public Awareness of Science where they talk about science to policy and, and one of the courses that they do there is a science to policy course where you're trained to write letters to the editor. And I see Frank Yotso is here and he's well accomplished at that. But in our roles as scientists here, in changing the narrative. Can you offer any further advice in strategy and how we might do that? Well, I can't say I'm familiar with the, the goings on here, the letters to the editor. Um, but I mean, one of the, 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 the issues that gets me in a bit of hot water is um, I argue that the role of science in the climate policy debate has been overstated by people on all sides of the debate. And this whole skeptics, alarmist, one side, the other side debate, um, it is what it is. It's part, I mean, it's part of the cultural landscape in the US, it's part of the cultural landscape, the political landscape in Australia, in the UK. And one of the things that the debate over science um, does is it distracts attention from talking about policy options. Um, there's a famous political commentator uh, from the early 20th century in the US, a guy named Walter Lippmann. Um, he has this great phrase that I, I use in my book, and I, I repeat it as often as I can. And he, and he says that the goal of politics is not to get people to think alike. The goal of politics is to get people who think differently to act alike. And if I had one bit of advice to give to the scientific community, it's to recognize that people have different views on the science of climate change. It's not reflection on you personally. It has nothing to do with your authority. But at some point, we let it lie. And we say, you know, you have your views, but hey, would you like to have cheaper energy? Um, I think that that's the way that you get people to coalesce around political ideas, not this battle over what they should or, or don't believe, or it, which I think is um, actually hurting the scientific community. Um, and it, those fissures show up within the scientific community. Thank you. <laughs>